to the ART and to this extraordinary panel discussion that is taking place on the set for All the Way. This panel, All the Way, the Civil Rights Act from 1964 to today, is being co-presented by, uh, by the ART and the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research. And I just want to say a word about our ongoing collaboration with the Du Bois Institute. Uh, we had an incredible panel two years ago uh, that surrounded the production of the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess that Skit moderated for us. Uh, we've had roundtable discussions most recently about our National Civil War project and in the case of the particular roundtable that Skip uh, held for us at the Du Bois Institute, the subject was Uncle Tom's Cabin. And uh, we're looking forward to many more partnerships with this incredible institute on campus. Uh, it's an honor to begin by uh, introducing the panel, my honor, and I want to say a few words about my friend Skip Gates. He is the Alphonse Fletcher University professor at Harvard University, the director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute, literary critic, educator, scholar, writer, and editor, author of Life Upon These Shores, and the forthcoming The African Americans out on October 1st. That's my plug for you. <laughs> and uh, several documentaries, including Finding Your Roots. Uh, he is the recipient of over 50 honorary degrees and numerous academic and social action awards, including the 1981 MacArthur Foundation Genius Award, uh, National Huma Humanities Medal, 1998, and in 1999, Skip was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Uh, now, for our panelists. To our left here is Peter J. Fernandez. He portrays NAACP President Roy Wilkins in All the Way. This is his ART, de ART debut, and we are delighted and honored to have him at, uh, as an artist here working with us at the ART. He has done uh, many shows, including uh, Cyril de Bergerac, Julius Caesar, The Merchant of Venice on Broadway, and, off, and an off-Broadway, CQCX, Richard III, and Thunder Knocking on the Door. TV appearances include House of Cards, The Good Wife, and Law and Order. Uh, Peniel Joseph here, two in here, is the alumnus, is an alumnus Caperton Fellow of the Du Bois Institute, founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, and a professor of history at Tufts. He is author of Waiting Till the Midnight Hour, a narrative history of black power in America, and Dark Days, Bright Nights from Black Power to Barack Obama. He is currently at work on a biography of Stokely Carmichael, who is a character in All the Way. Right here to my immediate left is Timothy Patrick McCarthy. He is the director of the Sexuality, Gender, and Human Rights Program at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, and lecturer on history and literature and on public policy. He is an editor with John Stauffer of Prophets of Protest, Reconsidering the History of American Abolitionism, and with John McMillan of and with John McMillan of Protest Nation, words that inspired a century of American radicalism, and the Radical Reader, a documentary history of the American radical tradition. And to Skip's left is Patricia Sullivan, an alumna fellow of the Du Bois Institute, professor of history at University of South Carolina, and a leading authority on the history of the NAACP and author of Lift Every Voice and Days of Hope. So I ask you to join me in welcoming Skip Gates, our moderator, and this extraordinary distinguished panel for today's discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Diane, and thanks to all of you for coming out this afternoon. We'll um, uh, talk up among ourselves for about, up here, about 45 minutes, and we'll open it up to you, to the floor for 30 minutes, and then we'll all meet out uh, in the lobby. Is that right, boss? That's right. Okay, great. Um, I remember when John Kennedy, I was um, 13 years old when John Kennedy was assassinated, and I remember it. It's like everybody was alive at that time and old enough. I remember it like it was yesterday. But I also remember coming home in the horror, that my, uh, particularly my father felt that Lyndon Johnson was going to be the President of the United States, and the future of the Negro was in his hands. In fact, my father, who was a very funny man, my father, some of you knew my father, my father's the funniest human being 
on the face of the earth. <clears throat> my father made Red Fox look like an undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> my father to his dying day called Lyndon Baines Johnson, Lynchin Baines Johnson, because he thought he was a redneck all through and through, and he also thought that he was responsible for John Kennedy's assassination. This is not what we're going to talk about, but I just want you to know the barbershop level of political discourse that uh, informed the shaping of, of my intellectual uh... <laughs> So let's start with uh, Pat Sullivan, the distinguished historian. Given a, uh, LBJ's background, and all that was a preface to his background, his mastery of the Senate, his friendships in the Senate, why do you think he cared at all about civil rights, especially in his first days in office? Or did he care about civil rights in his first days in office? I think he did care about civil rights. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was a poor boy from Texas, uh, and he um, had, you know, he worked in the New Deal for the NYA, uh, which uh, Aubrey Williams ran. So he came from a sort of a liberal Southern background. Oh, my NYA. The National Youth Administration, uh, the New Deal program that, that supported youth during the Depression. And uh, so I think he was open uh, to uh, the issue. And I think his political ambition, you know, Lyndon Johnson had aspirations to be president. Uh, and he was a Southerner, as your father noted. Uh, so he uh, needed to be someone who could appeal nationally. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the combination of political ambition, personal experience, and the Southerners he was involved in during the New Deal, Virginia Durr, uh, Aubrey Williams, Clark Foreman people who were early civil rights supporters in the South. So he had good teachers. Um, and I think he really sort of grew into a position by the time John Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, he was prepared uh, to carry the torch forward. Uh, I mean, the pressure of the movement made it essential that something be done. So he responded to that. But I think he also had a personal commitment that when the political opportunity presented itself, he was prepared to lead. And indeed, I think as, as the play shows, he did in terms of the passage of the Civil Rights Act. There's a line in the Butler, when the Butlers are talking about Johnson, and they say, well, at least he doesn't say nigra. Now or no, nigra, niggers have become nigra, I think. Uh, was Johnson a racist before he became president, do you think? You know, most white... He kept those sharecroppers. Remember, uh, I remember this. Time Magazine did a big expose that he had these sharecroppers living in like slave quarters on his cabin, uh, on his on his sort of farm, which is like a pseudo plantation. Uh, but then when he was embarrassed, he gave him a better house. Well, you know, I mean, Lyndon Johnson, like most white Americans of his generation, was a product of segregation, North and South. And I think you know, when you look at people historically uh, to sort of see how they fit in, uh, you know, I kind of am interested in what they do. Mm -hmm. And I think his actions uh, distinguish him as someone who was a, a positive force in the struggle for civil rights and racial justice. On a personal level, you hear anecdotes and you can kind of you know, draw your own conclusion about who you would put that label on. Um, but I think you know, we need to remind our students that segregation had such an impact on white Americans across the board, mm -hmm. how they behaved, how they responded to situations. But I think, again, historically, Johnson is someone, as the play demonstrates, uh, who really uh, was a force for change when it mattered. Oh, absolutely. I was just uh, trying to get you to talk about how far his sort of narrative arc, how far he might have come. And he came a long way. He came a long way. But you know, I, I think his response to what happens post-64 in terms of the urban disturbances and rebellions uh, shows that he had some real limits in understanding that, that issue, so, but complicated, and he did definitely come a long way. Okay, Peniel Joseph. Now, talk about how the black leaders portrayed in the play, and if you haven't seen the play, buy a ticket on your way out. I mean, this play is, is if you can. <laughs> oh, I got 100 tickets I'll sell for $1,000 a piece, you know? But it's riveting, this play. You know, I have, um, I never sit through a three hour play. I'm on the board of theaters and I don't sit I just find an excuse to leave at intermission. But I, it just passed just like that. I mean, it was riveting. It's a great play. <clears throat> Particularly because of the performance of Roy Wilkins. <laughs> and Stokely Carmichael back then. 
Um, talk about how the black leaders were trained in the play, Peniel. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., Roy Wilkins, Stokely, how they viewed Johnson. Johnson was in many respects um, a redneck, and his role in gutting the 1957 Civil Rights Act led many black leaders rightfully to distrust him. So related to that, how did Johnson's ascent to the presidency shape the competing views about democracy as imagined by SNCC and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, uh, one, the actors here uh, definitely deserve um, special applause because they do such a fantastic job of um, really detailing the complexity of black leadership. So you've got Roy Wilkins, who is not just some kind of um, Uncle Tom, but really is thinking institutionally that he needs to work with his president and wants the NAACP to have access to the White House. So I think that's done very well. So a guy like Roy Wilkins is perceiving of Lyndon Johnson. Whoever's president, Roy Wilkins is going to have a pragmatist approach to whoever's president. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. is going to be more um, skeptical, especially initially. And what's great about the play, I think the best part of the play is the, the historical arc from the Kennedy assassination um, all the way up until the election of 64. So 365 days that sort of changed the world, a little less than 365 because Kennedy's assassinated November 22nd. Um, so uh, Martin Luther King is almost, um, when we think about 63 and how he's perceiving LBJ, almost uh, a radical in the sense that he's, he's, he's trying to uh, push the envelope and trying to hold the president's feet to the, to the fire. Um, Stokely Carmichael, who's, who's portrayed very aptly, uh, uh, in this play is going to be somebody who's very, very, is, is a dissident, is a radical, a civil rights militant who's a few years away from becoming a black power revolutionary. Um, what's great about the play though is that Stokely and um, Bob Moses and SNCC represent uh, what Harry Belafonte called the shock troops of democracy. These were the young people who were going into Alabama, into Mississippi, into um, Arkansas, Southwest Georgia, and they were basically just getting their asses kicked um, to make sure that this thing called democracy would really happen uh, in the South. So Stokely and Bob, people like Bob Moses, would be vehemently very skeptical and critical until, um, really, until, uh, even after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, but until Johnson very forthrightly comes on the side of civil rights. But even when he does that, they still want more in a way where Martin Luther King Jr. pragmatically becomes an ally of LBJ. He campaigns for LBJ. There's a great picture of King campaigning in Baltimore for LBJ. That's the cover of Taylor Branch's um, um, uh, At Canaan's Edge, which is the last part of the three-part trilogy, America in the King Years. But people like Stokely Carmichael, they're supporting the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and, and Peter portrays Aaron Henry, who's one of the activists of the NFDP. And the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was an integrated uh, delegation that tries to unseat the all-white delegation in Atlantic City in August of 1964. And the, the, the actress who plays Fannie Lou Hamer is extraordinary too, because Fannie Lou Hamer is really an unsung hero of the 1960s. She's a sharecropper from Ruleville, Mississippi. Um, she is abused and beaten in Winona, Mississippi by, by both white authorities and black prisoners who they forced to beat her. Um, and she's the person who's doing a live testimony before the Credentials Committee. And what's great is it shows uh, Brian Cranston's LBJ says, hey, we can't have this woman um, unmasking, you know, showing what's going on here. And he does call a press conference. And they do turn it away from Fannie Lou Hamer is telling us what's going on in Mississippi to the president who's not talking about anything. Right. And Johnson calls, a, you know, emergency press conference in the Rose Garden to get all the cameras away from her testimony. Fannie Lou Hamer is famous for uh, the line, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. yeah. And, and she says, is this America? You know, the right. land of the free, the home of the brave, when uh, black people are being beaten just for trying to vote. And in her line, be decent human, live like decent human beings. Uh, Peter J. Peter J. Fernandez. This is probably the first question that an actor gets asked, of course, but how did you go about preparing for the role of Roy Wilkins, who at the time, ladies and gentlemen, was the head of the NAACP. And you were masterful and captured what I would call his pragmatism to a T. In the course of playing this role, do you ever find yourself taking sides with one of the other viewpoints represented? Namely, speaking the words of Roy Wilkins, but really wanting Stokely to win? 
Absolutely. Every night. <laughs> there are actually only two scenes in which you see all of the, um, the, uh, the, the black civil rights leaders. There are only two of them. And they're not that long, but the writer has done such a wonderful job of, of painting the, um, the struggle that they're in. Because they're all right and they're all wrong in the very moment. Right. Um, and things are changing so rapidly that that's kind of inevitable that they'd all be right and wrong. Um, even while they're in the hotel room having this discussion about tactics, things are happening. The, the Fannie Lou Hamer thing and so many other situations. The three um, young men who died and uh, were put in that deep grave and, and they found them later on. Um, violent uh, things were happening. Good Cheney and Swart. Yes, yes. Um, bad things were happening as they spoke. Um, they're all right and they're all wrong. Um, you also have the uh, three generations. You just have, now I'm old enough to remember Kennedy's death. I was a 10 year old kid. I remember exactly where I was and I remember going home and looking at the TV with my eyes wide open. Um, but um, Roy Wilkins was a man of his time. He's an older man. Uh, Martin is in the middle. And then you have Stokely who was what? 20, how old is he, Will? 23, 22? And had already been in prison um, on Parchment Farm, which was no joke. Yeah, right. um, so they all had uh, uh, currency to play at that time. In terms of preparing for this role, well, again, as I say, I, I, I kind of remember the period. I was a child, but I certainly remember the events. My parents made it very clear to me what that meant for us. Um, and our future. I remember thinking that... And you grew up here. Yeah, I grew up here in New England. Um, I remember when uh, Martin Luther King died, thinking along with everybody else, that's it. That's it. The cities are coming down, life is over, that's it. We're going to die. Um, so, I have always been a fan of history, and when I got a chance to look at this script, I went, oh, this is an important play. Um, we're not just dealing with facts, we're dealing with the multitude of, how would you describe it? Um, well, we're dealing with facts and the multitude of, of uh, opinions and changes and attitudes and feelings and um, uh, 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 orientations that all collide at the same time, which we don't normally see. Uh, uh, a black woman approached me last week after the, uh, mat uh, the matinee and she said, you know, I just want to thank you because when we talk about the civil rights movement, and certainly for a lot of the young people who are even interested, um, you hear the name Martin Luther King Jr., rightfully so, but we don't hear much about anybody else. She says, we hear about the icon and we don't know about the background. And what was interesting <coughs> about it was, you see the struggles of all of these men trying to grapple with this huge, huge issue and trying to do the right thing and being, you know, three-dimensional human beings all at the same time. So um, I certainly am a student of history. Um, uh, the play spoke volumes to me. And then the beauty of it was we have a tremendous uh, dramaturgical staff here that did incredible research. And you have a company that spans the age of time. I mean, we have people who were very much alive and adults during that time, those who were children, and then we have younger folks in the company who were not even alive then, and the dialogue was very lively, um, very honest, um, very clear, very pointed. Uh, a, lot of history ha a lot of history was revealed just in that amount of time. Which character, historically, do you like? You, you mean in the whole play, or you mean of those? Yeah, uh, in the whole play. I mean, which of those guys, not the actors, of course, but the historical figures, now that you've researched them, which one do you think is your boy, you know? Is it Roy? Is it Stokely? Is it, is it Martin? Who is it? See, you know, I, I don't think it's either of them. Though, I, I admire every last one of them. Um, it's Fanny Lou Hayman. Oh. And tell us what? Well, she was first a black woman, and nobody wanted to hear what a black woman had to say. Right. Um, though she was educated, she certainly wasn't educated on the level that any of them were. No. Um, had not had any of the opportunities that they had. Um, but had, and, and was beaten. I mean, Roy did his time, they all did his time, but nobody other than Stokely, who had been in prison, went through anything like what she went through. Um, yet she was clear, she was vocal about it, 
and she said, I'm going to say something if nobody else will. She went in front of Congress and was about as articulate and as clear as she can be, um, despite what she had been through. Uh, she made it very clear. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I feel, and if you can't hang, too bad. No, it was great. The, uh, I mean, the President of the United States, the only way he could shut her up was to call yes. a press conference. I mean, yes. that was amazing. She was great. And the, the, the traditional civil rights establishment, I mean, let no one be naive about this. The image of the Negro in public was controlled. Mm -hmm. They never would have let a woman like mm -hmm. Fannie Lou Hamer speak for the race. Mm -hmm. Never. She was too dark complected. She was uneducated. Uh, she was a large woman. You know, and she spoke uh, not the King's English, but the people's English. There's just no way they would have just said, we will translate your concerns into um, standard English, you know. I, they just wouldn't have let her speak. So it was unprecedented. It was a sign that the leadership of the movement had changed considerably. She was a force of nature. There's no way about it. Tim McCarthy. Now, your work on radical movements uh, in the United States, academically, is prolific. Is there any way in which you could see Lyndon Johnson as a radical? How did his deal-making to get the Civil Rights Act passed into law it's very interesting. How many of you all saw Lincoln? Like everybody. And very much, I very much thought of the scene when Lincoln says in Spielberg's Lincoln, basically, God damn it, I'm the, I'm the most powerful man in the United States. You, you tell me I can't get this done. Let's get it done. That was Lyndon Johnson every minute of every day. <laughs> and I wish Barack Obama had a little Lyndon Johnson in him too. Um, but how did this deal-making genius of his to get the Civil Rights Act passed into law spur on the growing radicalization of younger black leaders like Stokely or even Malcolm X, who we don't see in the play. Yeah, it's a great question, and it begs the, the immediate quip, which is, if you're the most powerful man in the world, why don't you do more with that power? And that's true of all American presidents, not just Lincoln and Johnson, although they did, they did a lot more than, than most did. I think one of the things that I love about this play is the way that it, it, it tries to intertwine these sort of histories of politics, the protest politics and the more pragmatic or more formal politics. And you don't often see that. Oftentimes when you have literary representations or historical representations or you know, theatrical representations, you pick one of those stories or you pick one foreground and the other one gets a little bit of short shrift. And I felt that this play was extraordinary in the way that it gave kind of equal billing and airing to those, those narratives which were absolutely wrapped up with one another at that moment in history. I mean, this was a moment in the history of the nation, 63 and 64, where you see those two narratives of protest and pragmatics come together in a way that is uh, extraordinary, even for the history of the United States. And, and, and I love that about, about the play. And you know, whether or not Johnson's a radical, it's a great question. Relative to his fellow presidents, mm -hmm. Johnson was absolutely a radical. When you, when you line him up with all of the other presidents in the history of the United States, including the current one, you know, and you're going to assess them on how progressive they were in terms of their legislative victories, in terms of their temperament, their empathy or sympathy for the least among us, etc. I think Johnson measures up well. You always have, because my father always said, you open with your, your father, my father always, you know, he said, God damn LBJ, because LBJ, in the first part of his presidency, he was something to behold. And my father, my father sort of loved him because my dad was coming into education at precisely the moment when, when, when Kennedy was assassinated and Johnson took the presidency, and he understood that Johnson got the imperatives for education and civil rights and these kinds of things. He, he really felt that deeply, and Vietnam derailed him. Right? So my father had this great faith in this president when he inherited the presidency after the Kennedy assassination, ended up squandering that opportunity domestically to, to engineer this sort of affair uh, in, in, in Vietnam. And so you know, that radicalism that was there, that radical spirit that was there, that was very much inspired by the movement outside of the political institutions and channels that he operated in had spurred him and created in him, I think, a, a, a way of seeing him as a catalyst for radical action, the implementation of radical ideas and aspirations within formal political and social and economic institutions um, that's, that's largely unprecedented in the history of the United States. Was he himself a radical like King, like Carmichael, like Hamer, like so many of the other people that you see represented in the, in the play? Absolutely not. 
But Jesse Jackson, I remember, when my first campaign presidential campaign, I ever worked on was Jesse Jackson's campaign uh, in, in 88 as a, as a high school kid. And I remember Jackson, I don't know if it was at the time or subsequent to that, when he was describing his presidential campaign, he talked about that the great moments of social change in the United States happen when there is an enlightened leader ready to be moved by an energized electorate. And if ever there was a moment in our modern history where we've seen that, I think, played out in sharp relief, it was that moment of 63 and 64 when Johnson inherits an uncertain kind of political position in very, very unstable political times and is able to channel the radicalism of that energized electorate, many of whom are energized because they don't have the right to vote and participate in the electorate that they should have the right to participate in. And he was moved in that way. And so on these issues, uh, he was most radical on these issues. Uh, and, and so I, is he a radical relative to his peers? Yes, but in terms of the spirit of the movement, I think he was a vessel for that change. And that vessel was moved and fueled by the radical protest of people who never had access to the kind of horse trading that he mastered as a senator and a president. Great. Uh, Pat Sullivan, there's so many vivid characters uh, in this play that I'd like you guys to reflect on. But the ghosts in the room, without a doubt, were the Kennedys. Both JFK, who's obviously dead, and then Bobby, who was trying to put Lyndon Johnson lights up. So what did the relationship? <laughs> so what did the relationship with Bobby Kennedy? I mean, why did the relationship with Bobby Kennedy continue to matter so much to LBJ? Well, because he he uh, thought Bobby wanted to be president, and that you know he in the play he calls himself the accidental president, right? Yeah. And of course, uh, it's legendary. We hear it all over and over how much they hated each other. And that is true. Uh, but I think looking at this period, uh, the kind of roles they play together, uh, it's really complimentary. I mean, the play, you know, couldn't get into all that. Bobby is sort of a ghost in the room, you know, and, and I think they handle that well. This is sort of another, another tangent. But when, when Johnson becomes president, uh, on November 22nd, 1963, he inherits something that's already begun in the Kennedy administration. And I think one thing that impresses me, I'm working on a book about Bobby Kennedy right now, is his Justice Department. You know, that uh, as Attorney General, the Civil Rights Division he built and the kind of work they did, they were the primary lobbyists for the Civil Rights legislation. They wrote it and they lobbied for it all the way through. 64. Bobby was Attorney General until August of 1964. So I think, you know, we can look at the personalities and that's very interesting and we all, but you know, people don't like each other. I mean, this is sort of a problem often, you know, if they're in power and grabbing for it. But in terms of this Civil Rights uh, Act and, and their response to the pressure and the opportunity created by the Civil Rights Movement, I would say both, because I think both the Kennedys and Lyndon Johnson were inclined to be sympathetic. But they were political. And this gave them, I mean, it was essential to act, it gave them the leverage to act. So um, again, the play doesn't get into this, and I think that was correct. But they don't sort of call it either way. He is sort of the ghost in the room. And I think a play like this will encourage people to read more about the period. But I think I would underscore that this sort of, um, you know, Tim pointed out this environment and the interconnections between what happens in the spring of 63 after Birmingham which makes it mandatory, something must be done. Uh, what does President Kennedy say in his speech? 100 years of delay, right? The cities are burning, we must act. And pushing forward uh, to do that and relying on this work the Justice Department has been doing since 1961 on voting rights with John Doerr, on school desegregation uh, and the rest and, and being ready to, to move into this, into this moment. So, in other words, Johnson was trying to exercise the ghost of JFK to uh, certainly at the very beginning of his presidency. Do you think he ever did? I mean, do you think, we know he had a tragic ending. He refused to run for a second term. I remember that speech vividly. It just popped in my, my head, actually. Uh, but do you think he ever felt that he owned the White House at the peak of his power, that he had exercised the, the ghost of JFK? You know, this, the demon of illegitimacy and, and contingency accident that thrust him into power. You know, I think the end of the play, when he wins in 64, that landslide victory over Barry Goldwater. And of course, it was a landslide. But that summer, things started to turn. 
you know, less 10 days after the Civil Rights Act passed, you had uh, a police officer shoot a 15-year-old in New York City, and you had race riots in Harlem, Bedford Stuyvesant, you had Barry Goldwater preaching law and order. Uh, so I think when he won, I mean, the, the play ends at, at that moment. He's still sort of obsessed with Bobby. Um, but, but having the victory of the Civil Rights Act and then the Voting Rights Act, I mean, he really, you know, had that. That was his. He did that. And, uh, but I think the play ends on that note, which I think is, um, is correct. Peter, what surprised you most in the play? I, you know, about Johnson, King, Hoover, any of the other larger-than-life figures um, that are portrayed in the play, or the events? I mean, what is the one thing that you called a friend or loved one and said, did you know something that you didn't know before? Well, uh, like a lot of people, I'm, I'm not privy to the inner workings of government. All I can do is say, why can't they even agree to tie their shoes these days? <laughs> um, but what was amazing to me was to be privy to those backstage conversations, those deals, those um, uh, uh, solutions, so to speak, that they came to, um, despite their disparate differences. I mean, they're all over the place, um, yet they still managed to cut a deal. They still managed to get something done, which many weren't happy with, um, but knew it was it needed to be done. It was inevitable. Whatever your reasons were behind it, they got something major done, um, and it was fascinating to me to see how that came about, especially given how things are today. Um, we see where we are. Uh, is this debt ceiling going to go away or what? Um, behind the uh, the the health care act, we're actually going to do that. We actually are going to do that? Well, it may very well be. That wouldn't have happened back then, I don't think. Um, so I would say that. Did you know about that, that Hoover had sent the sex tapes to Coretta? Before? No, I knew that he had taped, but I didn't know he had sent them. I took, a, I went with a, one of my uh, former students, and you know we were seated right over in those red chairs last Wednesday night, and he said, did that really happen, did that really happen? I said, oh yes, man, it really, that was cold. Uh, I mean, Cold, that is so deep freeze cold. <laughs> you know. But you didn't know that either. No, no, I okay. didn't. Um, are you far enough into the run to get a sense, Peter, of how audiences are reacting to these figures? Who are the heroes of the play? And who are, are the, the, well, J. Edgar Hoover? I can't imagine somebody applauding J. Edgar Hoover when he comes out for his curtain call. He's, he's certainly uh, the, uh, the bad guy. There's no two ways about it. Um, in his own way, um, LBJ is the hero of the play. Uh, and certainly through Brian Cranston's brilliant, brilliant performance. Oh, it's amazing. Um, you can't help but be caught in and, and drawn in because you see every side of him. You see his power, you see his arrogance, but you also see his weakness and his need for love like everyone else. Um, of course, Martin continues to be a hero, but all those black men are heroes. Um, as is Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, it's, it's hard to say. I guess some of the other enemies, it's interesting. My wife came and she said, I love this play, but boy, I sure got mad. It just kept getting madder and madder. And I said, well, who'd you get mad with? She said, those old crackers up there in the, uh, in the uh, Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, they, were, they played hardball, but um, I guess I... LBJ is the hero of the play, and I think he should be. This is his story, in many ways. Good. Um, Peniel, the political climate of the Southern Democratic Party in this play, it seems very familiar. I mean, it sounds like a Tea Party <laughs> politics, a Republican Party politics today. So, since in addition to being a scholar of black power in the civil rights movement, you're one of our most astute commentators on the contemporary political scene. Can you talk a little about how or whether today's political rivalries and ugliness grew out of those of the civil rights era, or are they different? Is there a continuum? Yeah, you know, I think that's a great question. I think that there are some continuums, and I think that um, there's also some, some differences and some innovations. I think on some levels, you look at Barry Goldwater in 64, and Barry Goldwater, who loses in a landslide, really becomes sort of the, um, um, the canary in the coal mine, who's really announcing 
a, a, a shift, right? It's a new day. It's a new day. Um, but when we think about even Nixon and the so-called silent majority and, and um, the Reagan revolution, <coughs> people still made deals, right? So they still made political deals. So you look at Nixon and, um, you know, there's relatively progressive um, legislation passed, but that's because of the Democratic Senate, Democratic House. But still, the president um, um, went along on aspects of domestic policy just to keep government functioning. I think in terms of contemporary politics, Re Ronald Reagan would have never been able to sign the tax bills that he signed into law if, if Democrats um, had been as, as uh, cohesive as contemporary Republicans. Or, or some people might say as obstructionists, right? Tip O'Neill calls up Ronald Reagan and says, Mr. President, I didn't think you could peel this many Democrats. Um, and, you know, congratulations, you did it. Because Tip didn't, he was Speaker of the House, he didn't, he didn't think Reagan could do it, but Reagan doesn't. Um, now, uh, you've got a Tea Party that is so, um, or a Congress that is so, um, that is so specifically <coughs> voting with one mind and one voice in an unprecedented way. No one could keep a caucus of 230 um, together the way they're keeping this, this caucus together, right? So it's, it's, our, our politics have definitely changed. There's no more um, pragmatic sort of bipartisan, except to go to war, um, um, legislation or decision. So I think things, the, the worm has changed, but you could argue that the Tea Party, there's a direct line to the Tea Party with Southern Dixiecrats because of the, the, the realignment that happens after the 68 election. Mm -hmm. um, so Johnson says the, the South has been lost for a generation, and it's really been lost for two generations. The only reason we have Barack Obama and the potential for Hillary Clinton is because the white vote is not as necessary as it was in 1964-68. So you get, Barack Obama gets 43% of the white vote, 39% of the white vote. Mm -hmm. um, so the electorate has changed, and in 2012, more black people voted percentage-wise than whites for the first time in American history, according to our census data, right? So whites are actually voting less. Um, so in, you know, if you can bring more whites out, who knows, but, but whites are voting less. Um, so there, there are c continuities, but I think what's new is this innovation of groups of legislators who can get elected and not legislate. And people are excited about that. There's a, there's a group of Americans who are saying, that's good, you know? We don't want anything passed because we want government to be to be much different, to be shrunken, right? But is that if there were a white woman in the White House, if Hillary had won, yeah, would we still uh, have seen this um, a particular degree of nastiness and ugliness in the Tea Party and the Republicans? Do you think? I mean, is this a race thing? Well, I think I think we would have seen some less. Uh, less nastiness, because I think some of this is, is very overtly racial. But I think in terms of policy, I think she would have had a hard time right now passing an immigration bill, passing anything. Because what's interesting about this constituency is that if your own constituents don't want you to pass anything, you, you've got an incentive not to pass anything. Mm -hmm. The only way we could change things now, contemporary-wise, is if we redistricted the country in a way that um, both Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Independents, you had districts where it was, it was a relatively even split. So to get your 50.1 majority, you'd need some kind of coalition, right? But, but if you have an all liberal district, all progressive district, or an all right wing district, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to talk to anybody or make any deals across the lines. The way in which I love to see what Mike Mansfield, right? Yeah. And, and um, um, Everett, Everett Dirksen, yeah. uh, Dirksen. And, and sort of convincing Dirksen that, you know, he says Dirksen's in love with his own voice. Right. And convincing him, who's saying he doesn't want this coming out of committee, but that you're going to be the trailblazer. One thing that Johnson does, and I think Reagan did this to the extent that Obama doesn't, is that I think that some people are saying now, glad, glad handling doesn't count. It doesn't matter, right? That's what the president's people say. But when you talk to people um, on background in the New York Times, people in the House and Senate, they're always crumbling that they never get FaceTime with Obama. Right. So the very fact that Lyndon Johnson was so good at at least uh, a veneer of civility and a veneer of knowing people's names, knowing people's what's going on in their family, um, was important to the legislative process. Obama says it's not. I'm convinced that if he was not- Are you kidding? People, when the President of the United States shows up 
Everybody kisses his behind. Exactly. Everybody's excited. I went to a reception the, for the uh, at the White House when right before the the uh, 50th anniversary of the march. It was like wait, well, a month ago, right? And I watched um, congressmen and women knocking people out of the way to get in the line when Barack was coming down the road, man. I mean, they were just pushing people out of the way. All they wanted was just to be blessed. It was like Jesus or the Pope coming by. So to be invited to the White House for dinner, it matters, man. It's a big deal. The Oval Office effect is huge. It's huge. Tim, um, we talked about the Fannie Lou Hamer scene, and it was so powerful, so haunting. Can you talk about people like Fannie Lou uh, Hamer and uh, Baird Rustin and other individuals and groups who tend to get written out of or, or largely ignored in the official narratives mm -hmm. of the civil rights movement? It's one of the strengths of this play yes. that they brought Fannie Lou Hamer and, and Baird role. Yeah. And also one of the strengths of the play, not just that they were included, right, but that they were engaged, they were integrated into the narrative of politics that this play was trying to, to represent. Mm -hmm. And so they're not just, you know, sort of window dressing, they're actually actors and agents of change in the play that I really love, and influencing the people who have all of this, all of this other power. The reason I uh, weirdly skip, there's going to be a moment I'm going I'm to flatter you, uh, one of the reasons why my career has sort of taken the trajectory it has is because when I was an undergraduate, you had just gotten here from Duke. Um, so much of the scholarship that you were doing at the time was about trying to discover these texts that have been lost to history, amplify these voices that were sort of that were silenced by history, and the, the way that you've kind of built this entire, you know, this, this amazing thing here on um, influenced me a lot back in the day. The idea that so many of the official narratives of the country, right, um, were, had left out all of these people who had actually made the country, right, who were responsible for this thing that we now have inherited. And, and one of the impetus behind my first book was this documentary history of American radicalism, which was the first of its kind at the time. And it was an attempt to bring the kind of history of radicalism in the United States to a place that it could sort of take its place alongside these official narratives, which often discounted or discredited or devalued the work of radicals, which has pushed so much of the best things in America to the fore, time and time again. The Civil Rights Movement is one manifestation of that, one part of this long black freedom struggle that dates back to before the founding. And so oftentimes you have people who are sort of written out of this. And now we have these official narratives of the Civil Rights Movement, of the Labor Movement, of the Women's Movement that also in their own ways privilege often, too often, this kind of great man version of history or great people version of history. Part of that is because those people leave records. Right? Historians need records to tell the stories that we do. And so the people who are in power, often people who are literate, often people who have people around them that save all their stuff, uh, we have those kinds of fragments to tell these stories. And so we tell them more robustly because they leave more for us to, to, to go on and also because they loom larger than life. So someone like King or someone like Malcolm X, they're going to be very large figures in this story of the modern black freedom struggle for these reasons, right? And so people like Fannie Lou Hammer, who, who, who LBJ in a good day referred to that illiterate woman, sometimes he put an expletive uh, before and after he said illiterate, and, and, and so someone like Fannie Lou Hammer, whose voice is so powerful, so much more powerful than the relatively more constrained men that we see in the play, including King at that moment, certainly Wilkins and others, not Carmichael, who's never restrained, certainly at that moment. Uh, but Fannie Lou Hammer is unrestrained in a way, and in certain sense she's freer right, to speak her truth, right? She says, I've been sick and tired my whole life. That's what comes before she says, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. She first says, I've been sick and tired my whole life. Now, I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired. So she's been pushed to this place. One thing that gets left out often in the narratives of Hamer is that she was sterilized by the, unbeknownst to her by the state of Mississippi in an experiment in 1961, right? This was a woman who was literally a lab rat for a racist state. And so she, of course, she's going to speak her truth because that's all she has in a way. And so she gets, you know, you know, earns her way into this place. 
And they can't even shut her up. They literally, the President of the United States, who already said this, has a scheduled a Rose Garden press conference where he's going to say nothing other than I might choose this white guy to be my running mate if he plays by the rules. That's all he says in that press conference. It's, it's devoid of any information or news, and yet they turn away from her. But she's so powerful that the networks and their late night coverage play the whole unedited speech of her testimony where she says these things and she does this. And so I'm always interested in sort of what gets erased either at the moment, right? There was an attempt that Johnson made to erase or silence her, and yet her story and her testimony was so, and her truth was so powerful that they couldn't be silenced, right? People recognize that. But there are also these other kinds of erasures. You talked about Hoover, right? The reason why Hoover was so obsessed with King's sex life is because he was so in denial about his own sexuality. We all know that, right? He's one of my people, gay people, but he, he, was, he was living at a different time, right? He had so much in his closet, he couldn't, there was no way to get a recording device in there to record what was going on in his closet, right? And so he's got to go out there and record what's going on in Martin Luther King's bedroom, right? And then send it to Coretta to try to undermine not only his work in the movement, but the marriage to the woman that he loves who is very much a co-conspirator. One of the things that I think is so interesting about this play is the, the how the women are represented. Fanny Lou Hammer becomes this, this, this powerful voice in the play, and yet we have Coretta and, and Lady Bird who in some ways are represented for a variety of reasons, some of which is really true to the historical record, as these kind of long-suffering wives. When in fact, Lady Bird Johnson, people don't know that Lady Bird, that, 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 that Johnson, in addition to being a redneck, was poor. He didn't have any money when he started out in politics. He proposed to her on the first date. She held off for 10 weeks because she was like, who's this crazy guy asking me to marry him on the first day? She, because she was came from a little bit of money and she was a wise investor, gave $10,000 to launch his first political campaign. So Lady Bird Johnson was a, was a co-conspirator, a collaborator, not an equal for a variety of reasons that had to do with marriage at the time and gender norms and dynamics, but you know she played a political role. He wouldn't, ha he wouldn't have been president, accidental or otherwise, without Lady Bird Johnson's literal investment and resilience over time. And you see this over time. We know Coretta Scott King's story now, but she got written out of the movement, the role that she played, that so many women played. Hamer emerges as this powerful voice at the moment of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. We have Joanne Robinson's memoir from Montgomery, where she literally tells the story about the women of Montgomery, who were the ones who organized the bus boycott in Montgomery that made King famous. So Montgomery made King, King didn't make Montgomery. And there were a whole bunch of black women who were affiliated with churches and labor unions and all these uh, different civil society organizations, as we talk about in human rights, in Montgomery that were doing the early organizing work of the movement, and yet they get obscured. We have Rosa, but we don't have Rosa's sisters. And so Joanne Robinson and well, we have a, well, we have a Virgin Mary image of Rosa. Well, right, and we don't even have the, exactly. And so Joanne Robinson participates a little bit in the construction of that mythology around Rosa Parks, but she's also complicating it, and she's adding more women to the narrative of that protest politics and organizing politics at the community level, which was the heart and soul of the democratic force of the civil rights movement, the black freedom struggle. And so we have to sort of think about this. Another erasure in the, in the play was, was, or something that comes out in the play, is Walter Jenkins' character late in the play ends up getting arrested for sort of, you know, fooling around with a guy in, 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 in a YMCA bathroom. Lyndon then, Johnson's. Lyndon Johnson's chief aide. Yeah. And so and, he and gets fired. The closest, essentially. Closest person to it. Right. And he gets fired. And we know, too, that the movement often did that. If you were someone who violated certain kinds of norms of respectability, whether they were racial norms of respectability or gendered or sexual norms of respectability, you got sidelined, silenced, or written out, too. And Bayard Rustin's a perfect example. Right, Bayard Rustin, who was the chief organizer of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, who had been an activist in the movement long before King in that middle generation that you talk about, to say nothing of the younger generation. He was the driving soul force of nonviolent civil disobedience, taught to him from Gandhi in India, and then translated to King into the movement. And he, too, is, is subordinated in a way in the movement because they were so worried about his arrest record in 1953 for fooling around with two folks in a car that he had been arrested for that he couldn't have the same kind of prominent place of leadership in the movement, which had an element of respectability politics that made it impossible for someone like Hamer and someone like Rustin to be fully recognized, not only by historians who document the movement, but, but the principles of the movement at the time. But Tim, if you're a very political person. Yes. Are you telling me that <laughs> Bayard Rustin is busted for performing oral sex on two white men in a car? Yes. 
You would not have fired him? No, I'm not saying I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. <laughs> 1963, hello. No, no, no. no. <laughs> it was 1953. It was even earlier than that, right? right, right. We're nowhere near Stonewall yet. But no, I, I'm not saying that the practical imperatives of the movement and the organizing at the time don't dictate that kind of firing or subordination or marginalization. Absolutely, I get it, right, historically. Um, but Rustin, I mean, but, but yes, I understand that practicality, but I also want to sort of revive Rustin in a way, not just as an organizer, right? But he was out and proud before out and proud was even something anybody totally. talked about. Oh, he's one right? of my heroes, don't get right. me wrong. So, so the pragmatics of the movement, the political imperatives I get, right? But that doesn't mean that historians don't have a responsibility to unearth those stories and do that. And they are now doing sure. that, right? That's what I'm saying. Okay. That, it, I, I might have suggested that Rustin take a back seat, not that back seat. <laughs> get, the, get the front seat of that car, or get out of that car, but take a back seat of the movement. I might have, if I was strategizing at that moment, I would have said that, but as a historian who values a kind of inclusive history, especially of social movements which are seeking to press the country to be more inclusive, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to do just that. Great, thanks. Let me ask Peter a question, then I'll ask one question that I want each of the panelists to respond to. And then we'll open it up to you all, since it's uh, about 5 o'clock. Uh, Peter, what was your favorite scene in the play, and why? Ooh, wow, that's a hard one. Um, gee whiz, my favorite scene in the play. Either, uh, to act and to watch. Well, of course, my favorite scene to act is anything that boys are involved in. <laughs> no, actually, actually, uh, my favorite scene to act, and I do very little acting in it, um, is uh, the uh, the funeral scene over the the body of Cheney, um, because it introduces the dynamic of Martin trying to appease, and then David Dennis, who just cannot con keep it in anymore. That's another Fannie Lou Hamer moment, if there ever was one. It's just a galvanizing moment in the play. Because not only does it, is it, does it ignite everyone on stage, it sends a ripple through the audience. Yeah, it's not that other shock. moment. It was an electric shock. Listen, I can see people from where I am, and I saw a man the other night, and I, I could be wrong, but I, his head turned all yeah. the way around. <laughs> um, there's so many good scenes in this play. I, it'd be hard for me to, 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 pull, to pull one out. Um, I'm sure maybe you all have favorite scenes, but uh, uh, it's just an amazing piece of writing. Okay, let me throw it out to each of you. Uh, was the right thing done by not seeding the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party? Mm -hmm. This whole thing is a morality play that culminates in this moment when they decide whether to seat the, the all black, well, the integrated, predominantly black delegation, the grassroots delegation as opposed to the official delegation, which is all white, from the Mississippi Democratic Dixocrat Party. And realistically, realistic, I'm not talking about Harvard pie in the sky, you know, <laughs> academic BS. I'm talking about the realities of the political realities of 1964. Did Johnson do the right thing? Panier, would you start? And I'd like each of you to vote on this. Well, I'd say, I'd say, um, you know, no, he didn't do the right thing. And I, I, I think the reason why is that um, when we look at Mississippi, that delegation walks out anyway. They were going to walk out. Um, his well, they walked out because they were forced to take two people from the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Two, two honorary, exactly. Right. Um, his, and one of them was black. And only yeah, one, and of one of them was black. black. Right. So his calculus is that if he does this, um, the whole entire South may, may leave. Um, and then there's going to be the promise that by 68 it's going to be open. I think that um, by not doing that, what it signaled to grassroots activists, including Stokely Carmichael, was that you could not trust the Democratic Party. That no matter what you did, they were playing at a level of high politics that was both racist, but also anti-democratic. So after that, not just Stokely, but certainly SNCC, because we've talked about Fannie Lou Hamer here, but the reason why Fannie Lou Hamer has that voice is because of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee which is the most important grassroots civil rights organization. It's, 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 it's black folks, but it's also white folks. It's Mississippi Freedom Summer. We only talk about the people who died, Schwerner, Cheney, Goodman, but there's 41 freedom schools and over 1,000 people there that summer, and so much good happens there. So 
Johnson makes an error for the entire party, I would argue, because if he had done the right thing, first of all, I still think he would have been elected, and I think you would have had the capacity, you would have built the capacity on the ground for grassroots activists to um, trust the Democratic Party. So there's a lot of trust that's portrayed, even though African Americans from 64 onwards are gonna be utilizing the Democratic Party because it's the only game in town. Mm -hmm. But people realize that they're playing politics. So I think that was, a, that was an error. Although I understand what you're saying, away from pie in the sky, but people like Stokely and people like Fannie Lou Hamer, they weren't doing pie in the, in the sky. The MFDP, they were organizing on the ground, right? So these weren't people who just were murder mouthing from you know, armchair quarterbacking, talking about white folks this, white folks that. These were the real deal people, and that's what's great about the play. So Bob Moses, I mean, these are people, so to, to imagine having the energy of Stokely Carmichael and Bob Moses and these folks within the context of, of mainstream politics, it would have been amazing. Um, instead, people go another way, and certainly Stokely, from there, is gonna go to Lowndes County, be one of the founders of the Black Panther Party, and he's on his way to both black power radicalism, but also pan-African revolutionarism, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism. But he, he says in 64 that we can't trust the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party lied. And he says, I was there. He's talking about Atlantic City. Uh, well, um, I, there's a person in SNCC who I won't Can you hear? Here. No. Uh, no. Here, use this one. You know, that they felt MFDP was so successful in getting in and having Mrs. Hamer uh, have her moment in the Credentials Committee, and then as Tim pointed out, being on the TV. And this person said, we broke it, we got in. Had a whole different reaction than some of the others. So I think there's a debate within SNCC of what, now in terms of Lyndon Johnson and, and that choice, you know, this is uh, what's happening that summer. George Wallace is picking up votes in the North, and the North is moving in a direction of backlash, right? And it, it will culminate down the road. But it, you know, you can look back and say, but politically, Johnson, I think, was, uh, was concerned that it could have a negative impact on winning. I mean, personally, I think it was the wrong thing. They should have been seated, that's me. But I think from his perspective, I think you could see an argument for why. Now, one of the scenes to me that is really heart-wrenching is when Hubert Humphrey, expects Fannie Lou Hamer to be sympathetic because he would like to be vice president. You know, that was a bit, seeing how out of touch he was on a, on a human level with who she was, where she came from, what she told about her beatings. So just the human disconnect between what they're thinking about there and the reality that's before them. Um, as far as the Democratic Party goes, Julian Bond, I mean, many people from SNCC went into the Democratic Party and ran for office. And so I think in the end, I think John, Lewis. John Lewis, I think a lot of people in SNCC, we mentioned how many times Stokely Carmichael was in jail, people were beaten, what they saw, which is burnt out. It wasn't just the MFDP moment, you know, it was just the whole experience of being there in Mississippi and having uh, so little in the long run change in terms of people's uh, livelihoods, poverty issues, and all of that. So I, I, I would say people should look at it and think about from the perspective of Lyndon Johnson, politically, you know, if you want to win, what do you do to win? And was this was this something that was possibly necessary to do? Was the signal the country gets if this delegation wins? I mean, Skip talks about representation. America is a racist country. If Fannie Lou Hamer is going to dictate how it plays out, that that could have a reaction. And Wallace, of course, big time. Forty-nine percent in Maryland, sense. Indiana, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a pretty volatile moment. Mm -hmm. Peter. That's a tricky one. Um, uh, I think he did the right thing. Um, I do think that there was damage, residual damage, because of what he did. Um, mistrust grew. Uh, I do think that alienating SNCC was not a good thing. But I do feel that in terms of what would be established down the road, um, it was necessary. Um, <coughs> His hubris, his fear, his paranoia played into all of that too. I wish he would have been more courageous and been able to say bingo, because I think he still would have been elected. But I think in terms of the long-term benefits for us, um, he did the right thing. Tricky. It's not a good feeling, but I think he did the right thing. Tim? 
Yeah, you're asking actually two questions. One is, did he do the right thing politically at that time? In which case, from right. Johnson's perspective, I agree that, yeah, he did the right thing. Um, and then the other question is, did he do the right thing morally, politically, in a, in a larger sense, right? And, and I would say absolutely not in that way for a couple of reasons. One of which is I think there's been so, there's so much focus in the play and in, in, in historical scholarship and in general kind of political common sense that Johnson's biggest fear was losing the South. When I actually think that one of John, that Johnson's biggest fear may very well have been losing the North. Uh, he knew he was going to lose the South the minute he embraced the civil rights agenda from the Kennedy administration that set that set in motion. And so you know there was no way that Lyndon Johnson was going to retain Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Right in the near term, if not and the, the long term, and he did. And so, by not seating them, it was in some ways a concession to the race of South that you won't bolt. Right. And, I mean, Johnson was a shrewd enough politician that surely, and someone from that, a Southerner himself, a white boy himself, he knew that the South was going to go. And so, it, it, it's always um, struck me that, that if he did indeed know that, which I suspect he did, you know, why then did he do this? And one of the things that I think. Um, may have strategically backfired is that Johnson, because he was so shrewd at managing all of these stakeholders, right, including the leaders in the black freedom struggle, uh, as well as folks in Congress and his colleagues, um, that I think he took for granted, my sense is that he took for granted that these folks would still continue to want to be engaged mm -hmm. and that he could, he could keep folks in the tent by compromising their livelihoods and their aspirations and their rights. Uh, for the sake of his own political viability and success in the short term. And that, I think, was a fundamental miscalculation. And that's where it gets it. There's a moral implication to this there. That, I mean, this may very well have been, it might have made sense to him, it might have been the right thing for him to do. But in the larger scheme of things, what he did was he put people's lives on the line in order to, 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 to generate his own kind of political success. And, but the, the other piece of me here that I think is also important is that it did that moment, 63-64, um, the re-election of, of the election of, of Johnson, did, I think, set in motion a kind of radicalism that characterized the rest of the 60s and 70s, frankly, uh, a decade or more of radical protests where suspicion of the liberal Democratic Party was healthy and robust, at times very divisive, angry, and violent, but it was there nonetheless. And I think in a democracy, we can talk about democracy in the big D sense, right, of the two political parties and the White House and Congress and so forth. But if you really cherish democracy in the small D sense, we have to make space for the kinds of radicalism that came out of that compromise. That, and particularly that kind of radicalism that challenged the Democratic Party, which is a party that still, to this day, frankly, takes for granted that all of us on the liberal left are going to get in line every four years to elect the lesser of two evils. And that is dangerous for small-D democracy. And I would argue it's dangerous for big-D democracy, too. And we see this you know, over and over and over again. We're expected to kind of step in line, and, and most of us do. And we hold our nose and we get in the voting booth or we don't vote at all and think that's some kind of active protest. Uh, but that, that to me, so, so the fact that the aftermath of that was to generate a kind of new generation of radicalism that was suspicious of the Democratic Party and of lib white liberals in particular, uh, I think that's actually been a healthy thing long term for our small-D democracy in the United States. The, uh, we're going to open it up, but it occurred to me, remember when Hillary made that a statement during the campaign. She said, everybody compares Barack Obama to, uh, no, to JFK. But JFK is dead. The man who really got things done was Lyndon Johnson. Remember, it was so controversial. Is Lyndon Johnson and Barack, I mean, without a doubt, the president wanted this identification with JFK. But was he, did he pick the wrong item? I mean, was Lyndon Johnson really the model, the idol that he should have grafted himself onto? Did Lyndon, is Lyndon Johnson the metaphorical father of Barack Obama? Really? Did he make it possible for Barack to be president? Well, I, I think when, when, he, when Hillary no, was saying it, I think, I think she was criticizing Barack's constant uh, invocation of MLK, um, um, of King in that sense. And she was saying, well, King had these great words and stuff, 
but, but it was LBJ who passed all that legislation. And I think that um, one of the things, I mean, the play is great all the way, uh, what it shows is that it's not just a top-down deal. So part of what's going on is that I think that Hillary was trying to compare him to MLK because at the time he seemed like this great orator, but she was saying, look, you, you need hard-nosed politicians to actually get things done. But this play is great because it shows us the way history works is that LBJ could not have passed the War on Poverty, Office of Economic Opportunity, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Head Start, all this stuff without this massive movement that was pushing the whole country. So in a way, one of the reasons why these things got passed, and sometimes people say, well, why did all this legislation get passed? Guess what? It was to save democracy domestically. That's what's going on. Don't think that they're not realizing that riots are happening in this country as early as 63 in Birmingham. Right? And it goes all the way through um, um, not just 68, but 69, right? Uh, they're doing this to save democracy, not because they loved black people or they were excited about poor people. Right now, they don't have to do it, which is why president, Congress, no one talks about poverty. In fact, they're cutting 30 billion from food stamps because there's not 40 billion. So, so, so this is not a top-down transformation that occurred. This was, this was both top-down and bottom-up, and I think that's what we think about LBJ, sometimes we give him too much credit because we're saying he's the guy who just did this like by remote control. He's only able to do this. And yes, is he a kind of political genius? Absolutely. But he's ready, he's, he's able to do this not just because of King, but because of the people who, who King is ostensibly mobilizing, which is the Hamers. Um, it's because of Stokely, it's SNCC, it's because of all that stuff, Tom Hayden, all this stuff, the new left is going out and it's forcing this movie. Mm -hmm. Actually, the quote, she, um, she talk, started talking, the, the quote that she got in trouble for, it was about John F. Kennedy, Kennedy. and then she added Martin Luther King. Oh, yeah, it's, um, I brought it along, because I was surprised myself, it's January 30, 2008, and she said, some people compare one of the other candidates, I wonder who that is, to John F. Kennedy, but he was assassinated, and Linda Bates Johnson was the, uh, the one who actually signed the Civil Rights Bill to law. Dr. King's dream began to be realized when President Johnson passed the Civil Rights Act. It took a president to get it done. So she did both things. She did both. One thing we haven't mentioned, and again, the play brings to the table, is Vietnam. And sadly, the war on poverty just was decimated by the war in Vietnam. And so for all of the onward motion, you know, the, the war and that Tonkin Gulf Resolution right there in 64, 64, you know, this play really disrupts our whole notion of marching through these anniversaries like a museum. Yeah. This lives. I mean, what happened in 64, you know, shapes so much of our world today. But the tragedy of Vietnam, and that's sort of another, that's a Kennedy ghost, I was thinking, because Johnson sort of blamed them. He inherited those advisors, but he made his own decisions. Well, they have McNamara showing up like a ghost. Yeah, that's right. McNamara looked like a ghost. Yeah. But, but that really took down that wonderful movement towards a war on poverty and, and really and it killed his presidency. And killed his presidency. Absolutely. Uh, Can I say one quick thing? Yeah, yeah, quick thing, and then we'll open it up. Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing. I, you know, I think Obama, President Obama is, is, as we all know, constrained in really profound ways in terms of how he can lead, what he can say, how he can say it, etc. Being the first black president, he says it's a race thing. It's most certainly a race thing. So much of this resistance is racist in its roots. And yet, I've said this over and over again to, to colleagues of mine, that, that President Obama may be a disappointment to a lot of folks, and he's not talking, he talks less about race and racism than any modern president. There's been a study that this documents this for a whole variety of reasons. But one area in which I think he may actually be seen by historians at some point as being the LBJ figure is with respect to gay and lesbian rights. Is that he has done more behind the scenes and overtly to support oh, yeah. the LGBT movement. Including and giving Barry Rustin the president. Including, including in 2013 freedom. giving Rustin the Medal of Freedom. And, and it's interesting because he, it's interesting that he's been able to be an advocate on that front. And he's not been an advocate on the anti-poverty, anti-racist front in the same kind of way. And, and, and I've said this before that I think he may go down in history as the LBJ of the LGBT movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I could be proven wrong, but I think that that's an area where he's been incredibly shrewd and traded horses and worked the movement and promised things and evolved in all these ways, in ways that are strikingly similar to some of the things that LBJ did with respect to black Great civil point. rights. And he got the vote. Questions, comments, ladies and gentlemen. I think, uh, Diane, what's if the... You, if you pick, I'll come to the... Okay, sir. I'm going to do this for about... Till 5.30, right, Diane? Yes. Yes, ma'am. 
I'd like to offer uh, some observations about the play that will lead to a question for the panel. My Short observation, observation yeah. longer question. Thank you. Robert Schenken seems to have written the play in a way that LBJ and JFK are, uh, and Martin Luther King Jr. are almost co-protagonists. And, and if I can use a chemical uh, analogy, each one of them seems to be the nucleus of a very unstable radio, radio uh, isotope that, that could explode at any moment. Martin Luther King having to keep in, in check the extremes of, um, of Wilkins and Stokely Carmichael, and LBJ having to keep in check the extremes of the Southern Crackers and, and the Happy Warrior of Hubert Humphrey. So my question is, to, to what degree did these two nuclei um, interact with each other in a covalent way? To what degree did, did the presidency of LBJ both enable and constrain what Martin Luther King wanted to do, and to what degree did it work in the other direction? Pat Sullivan? Um, that worked. You know, I think through this period that, that the play uh, focuses on, it, it, it certainly did, you know, they complemented each other. And I mean, King's, um, you know, the Civil Rights Act, I mean, we haven't really talked about that. I mean, it ended segregation. I mean, Brown was 10 years earlier. And, and the move to, to dismantle segregation in the South um, was achieved by that act, as well as several other uh, important um, titles. Um, but then as time goes on, they are completely on the opposite side when King comes out against the war in Vietnam and uh, is critical of uh, the the retreat on the poverty efforts. So. And LBJ feels personally betrayed. And, and, and he's so sensitive. I mean, he has such a really thin skin for a tough guy. Um, so, you know, it's sort of an arc of this period that we're looking at, I think, is very much they complement each other and really help to create this uh, remarkable transformation. But so, too, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, did Roy Wilkins. I think Roy Wilkins was very much opposed to King coming out. Um, is that right? Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. He was out on a limb. Well, yeah, on one thing that. in terms of constraining in Vietnam is that for a time, King actually constrains his voice on Vietnam because of the alliance. So King, if we're going to be really technical with King's career, as early as 65, there's a public statement against Vietnam where, where he's, he's criticizing the war. There's a phone call, and Lyndon Johnson is saying, let's not be separate on this issue. King then stays silent until April 1st, 67 at Riverside. The person who steps into this vacuum is my man Stokely. I'm Stokely's biographer. That's my guy. Um, and Stokely Carmichael is the nation's leading anti-war protester uh, for most of 66 into the spring of 67. SNCC comes out against the Vietnam War January 66. Stokely, after Black Power in June of 66, he's leading 10, 12,000 whites, but also blacks at Berkeley, at Howard, at Morehouse. Hell no, we won't go. He popularizes that chant. FBI, CIA, Lyndon Johnson, we've got these records because of the Freedom of Information Act. They're more upset about the anti-Vietnam War stuff and him connecting that to civil rights and black power than anything. They're trying to try him for treason. That's what's going on in 66, 67, and 68. And they almost do put him on trial for treason. And that's one of the things that I look at in the biography. But that's because King is constrained because of that, friend, that relationship. And King didn't believe that, I mean, something was much more radical than Martin Luther King, right? Yeah. So like you have Lyndon Johnson, he was constrained on one hand, but he also was constraining Stokely too, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, he loves him some Stokely. <laughs> but the book is out when? It's gonna be out in March. In March. Do you have those coupons you told me about? That everybody can, it's a great book and it's very, very important. I tease him about Stokely Carmichael all the time. Uh, yes. Oh, I know you. I don't know How you know about? No, no. You have to talk. In. Got to play by the rules. So I was pleasantly surprised to hear so much about Fannie Lou Hamer today. I didn't know she was so visible in the play and such a big part of the play. And I haven't seen the play, so um, that was great. But I guess I'm, I wonder how much of it was intentional. Um, and I also wonder, um, you know, what the lessons that you learned from watching the play, if there are any lessons that you learned from the play, um, and, and, and what lessons that we learned from the movement in terms of 
facing some of the challenges we have today, some of the, um, such as like voter uh, suppression and the redistrict, redistricting challenges, you know, that are make, seem to be making voting harder, the recent Supreme Court decision that seemed to be sort of taking a, a step back. Um, what are the lessons that maybe people who come and see the play might learn and, and what can we learn from the movement? But also, I guess the other part of the question is, um, were there lessons learned? Because I think, Neil, when you were talking about um, sort of how was the, 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 uh, the bottom up was really what made the, the change happen, was there a lesson learned there from the other side too in terms of like how to keep the bottom up momentum from happening that may be holding back some of the change that we need to confront some of the challenges that we have today uh, to democracy? Well, I'll give a, a, a short answer and then you guys all jump in. But um, one, of the, one of the reasons I like this play is this connect, <coughs> excuse me, is connected to the same reason I like the button, which is lifting the veil on the way black people talk to each other off stage. Like we've always had disagreements. We've always had a left, a right, and a center. From the first, from the first 20 black people probably who got off the boat in Jamestown in 1619. We have always had diversity of opinion, but people tend to, there are 42 million African Americans. There are more African Americans than there are Canadians. Okay? But we, we don't talk about Canada as like the Canadian community, like we do the black community. It is ridiculous. It is, an, uh, it is a big, organic, um, ever-changing, ever-shifting set of relationships that are in opposition to each other and, and reinforce each other and fight against each other. And the play does a magnificent job through Roy Wilkins and King and, uh, by the way, I, this might not surprise anybody who knows me in this room, I am a pragmatist. I never would have seen the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. I was, are you crazy? You people are, you need to be glad we even let you in the White House. <laughs> But you published their story. Huh? Yeah, I'm going to publish their story. But I just said, have some iced tea and, uh, yeah, you yeah. know, some biscuits and something. Get the hell out of here. What's wrong with you people? The whole country would have thought the Democratic Party had lost its mind in 1964 to let these Rudy Boot black people from Mississippi sit in the convention be real. No way was that possible. No way. But I like this. See, I'm doing this. Look at that. You're going to beat me with that mic. <laughs> he picked it right up, too. But, I know. but um, that is what I like about it. I like the fact that it shows the, the, um, the shades of opinion within the African-American community, just like the butler. The butler man is great because it shows the way black people, uh, you know, when the, uh, the funniest scene in the I mean, you've seen the butler. Remember when the butler fight under Ronald Reagan gets invited to a state dinner Cuba, Cuba Gooding Jr. bends over and says, motherfucker. <laughs> in front of all these people, I mean, in his ear. That's real, right? Anyway, uh, now would you like to uh, rebut? Yeah, I mean, in terms of, in terms of, uh, yeah, in terms of, in terms of 64, um, no, I think, I think that decision, I can understand people arguing that it's pragmatic. I actually think it was the wrong decision. And I actually think that um, you can make, you can do the right thing and still acquire political power. So it's not always a zero-sum game. So I, I, I would disagree with people who are saying that you know, they, they, sh they should have not seated the, the, um, the delegation. In terms of that question, in terms of lessons of the play, I think the big, the big thing it shows us is that one, this was all very hard. And I like what um, Tim and all the panelists have been talking about, these annual commemorations. And we've seen it with the March on Washington. Part of what we've done, and I say we, activists irrespective of race and generation who forced the country into a king holiday in 83 and forced the country into these commemorations what's happened is that the victories turn into ambivalent successes because now there's a mainstream cast of characters so we do this march on washington obama does a speech but we're not looking at the march on washington speech as a revolutionary speech which it is talking about you know cashing a check and reparations and all these different things so what it shows us is away from the mainstream commemorations, this was hard, this was messy, um, this was violent. 
people, like Skip is saying, I do agree there, that the black community vehemently has disagreements. The black public sphere is never monolithic. Segregation was one of the only things we could agree that we, 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 we needed to end. And that created unity, the illusion of unity, which never was yeah, really there. That, absolutely. So it creates this, you know, and we still, one thing I'll say in terms of contemporary politics, because Pat was saying it ends segregation, and, and in terms of law, that's right. But we have racial segregation right now in terms of public schools, and we're calling it but de facto not de jure, segregation. But not de jure. Yeah, yeah, we're calling yeah. it. But you no, know, there's difference. a difference, but in terms of outcomes, there is no difference. No, but it's a huge outcomes, outcomes. But it's a huge difference. If the law says. A absolutely, but we're talking about racial outcomes, in terms of racial outcomes right, right now. The segregation is. And, and um, David Williams at Harvard does the whole stuff, the, the stats no, that no, show us. Right. You yeah. can't say they're the yeah. same. That's no, I'm not saying they're the same, right. but I'm saying it. We still have segregation There's no right now. question that you're right. right. Now. Yeah. So, so the, the, finally, the, the lesson I think that we can get from today is, is one, how hard and messy this was. Two, the activists stay optimistic. And then finally, some of the people who are doing most of this work, it wasn't just Wilkins, it wasn't um, 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 just Dr. King. It's really you know the Aaron Henrys. Uh, Stokely is a um, a day-to-day -day organizer. So Stokely in 63 is part of just the people too. So he's not a celebrity. He's somebody who's down in Mississippi sleeping on people's floors and shotgun shacks in Alabama. Stuff that none of us in this room will ever do. So when people sort of try to criticize him, of course he can be criticized, but I'm always empathetic to the specific experiences that he goes through that none of us ever will. And those were the people who were putting their lives on the line for democracy. What's the title of that book? Saint Stokely what? No, it's called oh. Stoke, Stokely, Stokely a life. Stokely, <laughs> and he was not a saint. It's a critical body. <laughs> no. um, Final word from our panelists. Peter? Um, I would dovetail on what my brother just said here. Um, you asked about the lessons learned from the play and, and what do we take forward from it. Um, uh, what I love about the play is that the seeds of change are in the people. They're in us. Um, and I think if there's anything we've learned from this, change is not going to come unless we make it come. Those knuckleheads in Washington are not going to do what they're supposed to do. They are not going to get it together because they're concerned about themselves and themselves only until we make them. Um, young people, speak up. Organize and speak up. Um, yes, that involves some sacrifice, but uh, you saw what it wrought there. I don't think we're, I think in many ways we're going through a similar time. So you need to say what you feel, you need to stand behind your words and be willing to, to hold their feet to the fire. Um, we're just too quiet, we're too settled, <coughs> we're too passe. Now you're talking to an older person, <laughs> it'll be harder for me to get out there, but I'm preaching to myself too. Um, uh, the Caesar change are in us, they're not in government. They're in us. We are the government. And if we don't speak up, we're going to deal with, we're going to get what we deserve. That's all. Um, yeah, sort of coming over that and in response to the question, I think what the play showed us, I mean, we watched people in power, old Southern senators who were born in the 19th century, J. Edgar Hoover, all running around, sort of around this, this response to this effort to get this legislation. That was a response to grassroots. I mean, that's decades of organizing and movement. I mean, you look back through history, and it all sort of comes together. I mean, there had never been a civil rights bill that got past a Senate filibuster. Mm -hmm. And Johnson said to Kennedy, I don't think we can get cloture. You know, I mean, just the technicalities of the jujitsu of how you navigate this Congress that was dominated by segregationists. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they had to because on the other side was this movement that was not going away. And Peniel's point, I certainly want to clarify that what happens in, in, in the, that summer, and I think partly the MFDP thing and Johnson's reaction, is that people in the North, the movement has come North. Mm -hmm. Ruth Batson in Boston has gone in 63 a petition to get her children into school. There are school challenges across the country led by Robert Carter, the NAACP, job strikes, all of this. And northern whites are starting to pull back because there is segregation throughout. I mean, all through this period, um, from World War II up through the 60s, the whole racial landscape is transformed with the continued migration of blacks to the north. And by 1960, half of African Americans live in the north in segregated communities, housing, schools, jobs, and none of these, this legislation speaks to their condition. Um, so this is a real turning point period that raises the issues that we deal with today. 
I mean, you see the, the spike in incarceration begins in the late 1960s going forward. Uh, the criminalization, the response to northern protests. So it's a very uh, tumultuous period, but it all is in response to this movement that at least got us that far and got us the Civil Rights Act that transformed the country and really had political repercussions that uh, continue to, to shape our lives today. Mm -hmm. Peniel, Tim, final word. Uh, one other thing I just want to respond about to your questions, I think it's great. In addition, I think one of the lessons is clear that politics is messy, that the politics of social change is never uh, going to fully accommodate purists. Right, that if you are pure of principle or pure of ideology or pure of whatever, um, that you're always going to have to work with folks to get things done, even if those people are abhorrent to you. I think that's one message of it. But the other message that I found uh, that was um, something that I think that the theater allows for that other media don't uh, necessarily is the sort of how emotional politics is. That the, the moments in the play where you feel something physically and emotionally are those oftentimes that were staged in the audience, right? That you see this, we've already talked about the moment uh, where the, where, who is it? Uh, David, David, David Dennis. Dennis. David Dennis kind of emerges from the back of the theater and challenges King during the funeral of Cheney. The moments where the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party are, are organizing and handing out leaflets and picketing and shouting and these kinds of things. It's a moment where the, the audience becomes part of the play, or at least is implicated in the emotional energy around politics that is very, very real. And too often, I feel, we get, when we talk about politics, we're talking about reason. We're talking about you know, sort of rationality and logic and these kinds of things. And we, we, we strip it of its emotions, its sentiments, right, its passions, which is what politics at its best has always been. And it's worse, too. Right? But one of the things that you see in this play, the, the moment where, John, where, where, where Johnson is in bed and Walter Jenkins comes in and they have that very touching moment, which actually precedes the moment where he's arrested for you know, getting it on in the YMCA. There's this very tender kind of father-son moment that's a private moment where you see the thin skin and you see this sort of um, the, the, the yearning for love that Johnson clearly had as part of his core. And then you see other ways that his passions and emotions work themselves out in public settings. But I thought this play captured um, how that kind of emotional core of politics is navigated in public and private. That is an experience that we all have in different ways when we engage in the work of politics, the art as opposed to the practice of politics. And I think that this play offers us some really instructive lessons. And I think that the way this play is staged and the way that it's acted, um, and the theater as a kind of medium uh, is a wonderful place for the, that emotional piece to kind of come alive and, and be felt right, in a way that draws us in. That oftentimes we're drawn into politics because we're angry about something. We're frustrated. We're sick and tired of being sick and tired. That's what animates us to make change. Right? It's not that we're complacent or happy with the status quo that gets us to be engaged democratic citizens. It's the opposite often. And the fact that we have been discriminated against or excluded or marginalized or, or silenced. Uh, and the play captures that uh, in such a, a, an amazing way, in such a, a range of ways, uh, that I've, you, know, you sort of feel that you're part of this. And it calls you into a new kind of political engagement that I think we all need, that we all always need. Peniel, final word. Yeah, I think the, the most exciting part of the play, and I felt this way in terms of watching The Butler, was that the Butler, um, really the most important film on the civil rights movement thus far, makes you feel um, the, 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 the violence, the anxiety, the terror, the hope of, of, of that period of time. Um, so many of our young people are not getting this history. It's the period that I call the heroic period of the civil rights movement from the Brown decision to the Voting Rights Act. Um, there's a counter narrative here where we could look at different people, like Malcolm X is not in the play, but certainly, you've got Stokely, you've got Fannie Lou Hamer, you've got so many different people. It's very, very important. But the most exciting part and important part is that this play makes you understand that even though we think of this time period as history, um, this is America. And uh, this was not easy. Uh, the, the poverty, the racism, the constraints, you really, really feel. And also just the, the, the idea that somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. Um, was actually alive, that Stokely Carmichael was actually alive, Linda Johnson was actually alive. We've turned these people into icons in a way where it's the Greek mythology at this point. And this stuff really happened right here in this country where 
Jim Crow segregation is part of this racial regime of racial terror and institutional racism and really white supremacy. And so it makes sense that Obama's getting attacked if this only happened 50 years ago. It makes sense about Trayvon Martin if this only happened 50 years ago. So let's just be in touch, more in touch with where we are now, where we're at now, and how long we have to go um, to get a more progressive, bright future because we take all of this for granted. We, we, we just say that we, these people might as well be um, part of the Roman Empire the way we mythologize and ice, you know, we, we've plasticized this whole thing. We can't even believe Martin Luther King Jr. was alive or Malcolm X, right? Does anybody even believe it at this point? That these folks were alive? But they were, and, and they were part of this whole transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank our panelists for one. <laughs>